Hey friends, we've got a great show for you today. We are live with my friend Jay Warner Wallace, who makes a case as a cold case detective that Jesus is a person of interest without using the Bible. Uh, you know Jim from writing Cold Case Christianity. We had a chance to co-write a book together called So the Next Generation Will Know. Yep. It's been a dear friend, a mentor for me. Jim, I got to tell you, I think this might be your best book. And I mean that completely mm. sincerely. I think it's brilliant. I think it's interesting. And we're going to jump right in because my wife saw the cover, which I'm going to hold up here for a second. And she paused. She goes, ooh, that's interesting. And like you've got something not only in the cover, but the book that grabs people. So before we get into the content, how you make a case for Jesus, tell me first, what do you even mean by a person of interest, which is what you use to frame this book? You always ask the best questions. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know that uh, Sean and I have been, go back a number of years, but I'm indebted to Sean because I only wrote books because of Sean McDowell. He was the one who said, to, hey, you should write a book about this stuff. And that's what Cold Case Christianity was. So you know, brother, mm. that uh, although I know I'm a lot older, um, and yes, if I don't know why you would think I'm your mentor. You're the reason why I got involved in writing books to begin with. So, so this is all about you, buddy. And I'm glad to be on your program because I've been watching all the people that you interview on this on this program. And I'm thinking, my goodness, this this guy's gonna. Yeah, so I'm I'm just honored to be part of it. Now, hmm. let's go to person of interest. Yeah, I, when we picked that cover, I was very interested in trying to get out. Uh, um, I wanted something that felt more like. Uh, like fiction, like a like a, a mystery that we could okay. solve together. That I can teach some principles of of, of thinking uh, about evidence. To to now I, I know I did that in cold case, but this is the exact opposite of cold case. So yeah, so what I mean by person of interest, what I mean is that that you could make a case for Jesus. That cold case makes it from inside the New Testament. Are okay. the New Testament Gospels reliable? Should we trust what they say about Jesus? How do we know from a cold case perspective that we can trust eyewitness testimony? That's what cold case does. And it works from inside the, the New Testament. This says, forget about the New Testament. If there was no New Testament, what would you know about Jesus just from everything outside the New Testament? And that's what I wanted to do here. Imagine a scenario in which every New Testament has been destroyed. What would you know about Jesus hmm. if every New Testament manuscript, this avoids the problem then about like, for example, well, what does Bart Ehrman say or any skeptic say about whether or not we can trust the New Testament, uh, this reason or that reason or this contradiction or that contradiction or this piece of manuscript evidence or that piece. Forget about all of it. Let's imagine all of it was destroyed. You're still stuck with Jesus of Nazareth. I think you demonstrate his historicity hmm. and his deity without having to reference the New Testament at all. And that's what we're trying to do in person of interest. Well, you do it well. And the way you use it is with three Fs, the fuse and the fallout, which identifies the felon. Tell yeah. us what you mean by the fuse and the fallout, and then we'll start diving into some of the particulars. Well, so I just was where I'm working on a case right now in Los Angeles and the district attorney there is a fr old friend of mine. This is the first case he's worked in his career without me being the case agent. So I'm just kind of working on the edges, working on the closing uh, uh, for him as far as uh, it's almost ready to close in front of a jury. And as I showed this to uh, him and I, he's not a believer. So I'm showing him the evidence, you know, in this, this process. And he's going, oh, I recognize that case. I recognize that case. Yes, but I'm hoping nobody else does, right? Because I'm trying to use the cases from my career to kind of illustrate this process. Look, we've done a number of these, what we call no body missings. Okay. These are cases, usually it's a husband who kills his wife and then he claims that she ran off and, and you know, she willingly left him and it's just a missing persons report. And that's how it's usually taken. And then a number of years go by and she never returns. And it turns out he sold the house, remodeled it. There's never been a picture taken of the crime scene. There's never been anybody who investigated. Now it's been remodeled and completely destroyed. So, so how do I make a case in front of a jury when I have no body because her body never, uh, she, he got rid of it and I can't find it. And two, I have no evidence from a crime scene. That's the process we're taking here. Imagine we have no evidence from the crime scene of the New Testament. Okay. How could we demonstrate that Jesus is who he said he was? Now, in these criminal cases, I typically tell a jury, you know, on the day she disappeared, something horrific happened. And some explosive event, if in fact we think her husband killed her, occurred. But explosions are preceded by fuses. 
that fuse burns up to the point at which a bomb goes off. And then that bomb is, uh, ends up providing shrapnel all over the blast radius. So we can make a case in front of a jury from just the fuse and the fallout, even though we don't know what actually happened on that particular day. I've had cases where I can't answer the question, how did he kill her? Exactly. When did he kill her? How did he get rid of her body? How did he move her car? I can't answer any of those questions for a jury, but I still end up with convictions because I can demonstrate that the fuse and the mm. fallout identified the felon. Well, could we do the same thing with Jesus? If we didn't have a New Testament crime scene evidence, if all we have was the fuse of history and the fallout of history, could we make a case for the Jesus of history? Hmm. And that's what we try to do in person of interest. Well, let's talk about that. And one of the things you do in your book is you not only have uh, years as being a detective, but you're an artist too. And it's, it's honestly brilliant. So people are going to have to get your book to see some of the visuals. But let's walk through some of what you call the cultural fuse. And by the way, for those watching, we have two copies of Jim's book we're going to give away towards the end. Uh, for the best question, and Jim, we're going to allow you to pick what you think those best questions are, free book we'll send to you. So okay. the fuse are certain things leading up to the crime itself. You talk about a cultural fuse. Now, there's a bunch you go into your book we can't go into, but give us an example right. of maybe communication or roads of what you mean right. by the cultural fuse. So we're looking at the fuse of history that burns up to the appearance of Jesus. I think there are three strands to that fuse, and those strands are the cultural fuse and the uh, spiritual fuse and the prophetic fuse. Now, the, the cultural fuse really talks about what is happening in the governments and empires that existed prior to Jesus, leading up to the appearance of Jesus. And of course, all of this is about how much territory around the Mediterranean was possessed by particular empires leading up to the Roman Empire. Because it turns out the Roman Empire occupies the, uh, the largest section of the Mediterranean, really the known world at the time. And it, it, it occupies all of this territory. It provides a certain infrastructure that makes the, the ability to communicate the story of Jesus possible in a way that was never possible before. What I mean is, uh, if you look at the history of the Roman Empire and all of the, the civilizations that existed prior to the Roman Empire, you will see that it's only under the Roman Empire that we have the establishment of sufficient roads. All of those roads that Paul used to communicate the truth about Jesus to the world around him were only possible after the Roman Empire. You know, all roads lead to Rome. Well, it turns out that Rome had a period, the Roman Empire had a period of time in which they had conquered everyone and had a period of peace called the Pax Romana, in which they could actually take those resources, usually uh, uh, spent on war, then they could spend them on infrastructure. And they built roads and tunnels and bridges and improved the system of postal service uh, in such a way that the message of Jesus, as he appears in the first century, was easy to communicate to the entire known world. The reason why Christianity spread at the pace that it spread is largely due to the fact that it happened in the first century during the Roman Empire. Now, it could have happened. Look, here's the point is if you look at all of the, 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 the cultural conditions that had to be in place before a message like the message of Jesus could be communicated to the known world, it turns out that the optimum time to appear would be during that Pax Romana, that 200-year period of time in which a peace had been established and money was being spent on the infrastructure which allowed messages to travel. So there's a, an aspect in which you can kind of look at, you know, you see those, those scriptures where it says that Jesus um, kind of came at the, uh, you know, at, at the right time in history. And you ask yourself, well, what, what, what would be required for it to be the right time in history? Well, one of those things would be the cultural infrastructure that made the message of Jesus so easily communicable to all of the known world. And that's why we talk about that cultural fuse. That, that makes sense. So if we look at it from a human standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. then we see all these things that are right. lined up to make this possible. But on the flip side, if we look at it from a divine standpoint, you're saying if yes. God is going to choose to reveal himself, all of these things have to be in place. And Jesus comes in this narrow window with communication, 
with Rhodes, with the Pax Romana. So there's this cultural fuse that's yeah. building, but you also give what's called a spiritual fuse. And I love this because both of you and I have been, we've responded in different ways to the claim that Christianity is a copycat religion. And the yes. way you approach the idea that Jesus is a myth, I think is fresh and unique and frankly brilliant. So explain what you mean by the spiritual fuse and how you respond to the claim that Jesus was just cobbled together the savior from these other deities. Well, it turns out that every claim that Jesus is similar to some prior mythology from an ancient people group, and that somehow that similarity uh, it works against the reliability of the story by Jesus, actually works for the reliability of the story of Jesus. Here's what I mean. If, if what you'll see is I examined all of the um, ancient mythologies of the significant ones, where I mean, you could go on and on forever and all the details. Sure. But, but I tried to, I spent probably about, if, if not for COVID-19, this <laughs> never would have happened. This book would not have been written. <laughs> because as I realized, as I was getting to the end of that year, where we spent probably nine months sitting in front of a fire or in my study, uh, researching this book, I don't know how I thought I was going to make the deadlines if, if not for the fact that every event got canceled in that year from about, you know, what, February to July. And it allowed me the time to do the really serious research on this. So I read through all of the mythologies that people typically say, well, look, that's similar to Jesus. Well, yeah, broadly, there are broad similarities. I found 15 broad similarities between all ancient mythologies, all of them. Now, not everyone has got all 15. Usually it's like maybe the most is nine or 10. The least is maybe six. So somewhere between six and 10 of these 15 broad similarities are possessed by every ancient mythology. I don't care which one you're referring to. So if you look at Buddha and you look at Addis, they're going to share some similarities. Well, why would you be surprised? When ancients think about the nature of God, they think broadly about similar categories. So, look, if God is supernatural, he's probably going to work miracles. That's very that's the one common thing to all mythologies. Uh, he's probably going to appear miraculously. He may um, enter into uh, the next world miraculously. Well, these are things I think that we would expect of God if God is God. So you see these kind of ancient expectations of God being drawn out in the mythologies that people groups create. And then Jesus appears. And he appears. He's the only one who possesses all 15 hmm. of all of the expectations of ancient humans. It's as if, if you, if you understand this, and then you go back and you read uh, Acts 17, and you look at the uh, speech that Paul gives on Mars Hill, you will read that with new eyes, because uh, new ears, because you will see that Paul is really saying what, this, what we've discovered is that yes, you people are all very religious and, and you all have certain expectations of God, but I am here to tell you that your expectations, either in large part or in small part, were met in, in their entirety hmm. in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, again, why would this be the case? Well, I use an illustration in the book because, and I use it on my live uh, stage presentations, that's probably a little more visual, but, but when I was working undercover, I was uh, dispatched, and we, we worked undercover as a team, I had really long hair, I had a goatee, I looked pretty bad, and I was working a case, geographic, uh, um, we call these geographic surveillances. We don't know who the bad guy is, but we know that all these burglaries are occurring in our town in this neighborhood, so we would sit in this neighborhood, right, and we would just wait and see if maybe we'll see a burglar. What are the odds of you actually, not very good. Okay, so the odds of actually catching somebody this way is pretty lame. And sure enough, one day as I'm sitting waiting to see if a burglary occurs in front of me, I hear that the radio dispatch has dispatched a black and white unit two blocks away to a burglary that had just occurred. And I'm, only I'm sitting so close, I missed it by just a little bit. Hmm. So I'm hearing this, and I decided to jump the call, get to the call, get to the victim before the officer gets to the victim and take a report. So I drive over there, I'm in my playing car. I got long hair. I got a, a raid vest. I got shorts. I jump out of the car. I approach this guy who's waiting for a police car, and he won't even give me the time of day. I'm like, dude, I'm trying to get information because we got a surveillance team here. We could actually maybe get out in the in the area and catch this guy before he leaves town. What did you see? Did you see a car? Did you see any suspects? He won't even talk to me. Then the police car drives up. This dude gets out with a uniform, and he tells him the whole story. <laughs> well, what's the deal there? Well, see, he was expecting a police car to come and take a report. He sees me. I did not meet his expectations. He would not give me the time of day. The better that the uh, um, 
expector or the expected rather meets the expectations of the expector, the better the response. Hmm. It's as simple as that. If God intended to come in a way that meets the expectations of people who are seeking him, well, it turns out Jesus comes in the most robust way. Do you really think that the people who wrote the Jesus story, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, knew the depths of Egyptian mythology? Do you really think they knew the depth of Persian mythology? Do you realize that Jesus even meets the expectations of the people on the South American continent who describe Quetzalcoatl? Do you really think that somehow these authors knew? No, it's just that Jesus meets the expectations of all of us most robustly because he is the God who inspired those expectations in the first place. So in the so, end, I think this is actually evidence for Jesus, not evidence against Jesus. And if you put that yeah. in a timeline, you'll see this kind of interesting. I don't know if you remember or not, but you were the first person I ever showed that timeline to, other than Susie. So when we were, you know, when we were first, you know, uh, looking at this, Susie and I, I had basically a blogger's sense of this red zone. In other words, this period mm -hmm. of this window of opportunity that could occur. And where would it occur? If you overlap the, the, the worship of all of these ancient deities, because they don't all end up being worshipped forever. Some do, like Buddha is still being worshipped. But a lot of them, like Addis, is no longer being worshipped. So you can mark off a beginning time of the worship of Addis and an ending time of the worship of Addis. If you do that with everyone, you will see that there is one place where everyone overlaps. And then if you overlap on top of that, the prophecies of Daniel about when the Messiah will come, and you overlap on top of that, the Pax Romana, where you have that period of peace and all those roads are available and you've got this great postal service available, you end up with a small area of overlap in which all three of these strands are overlapping. And if you see it visually in the book, you go, wow. I mean, I, I remember showing you in an airport in yeah, Toronto. That's right. You know, with, with Brenda Crouch, remember we were sitting, we yep. had just done an episode of Huntley Street, I went under Huntley Street for our book, So the Next Generation Will Know. And I, this is how long ago, this is 2019, I think. And we were, hmm. I mean, I'd been working on this book for about a year back. So I was just kind of developing the visual overlap. And, and as I found it for Susie, of course, you know, it was really about the Pax Romana and um, the, the prophecies of Daniel back in the day, back, you know, 25, 24 years ago when I first became a Christian. But, I, you know, back then I had a, more or less a blogger's a sense of what the overlaps were of investigating this. Words, I wasn't trying to write a book with case notes and footnotes and cited and all of that. I was just kind of scratching out what I thought I was discovering evidentially. And when I remember showing it to Susie, it was like, like, bing, uh, it, uh, there turns out there's a red zone. You'll see it in the book as I overlap this visually between yeah. t about 29 uh, BCE or, or BC and about 70 CE or AD. And it turns out that overlap from 29 to 70, Jesus appears after one third of it. And then he's crucified at two thirds. He's right in the middle of the red zone mm. overlap. It's like crazy. And I, was, I, looked, I thought to myself, okay, so it turns out that if I didn't know anything about what caused that difference, you know, when you see those letters, BCE or CE, that, that Jesus would be a good explanation because he falls. So if you didn't know anything from the New Testament, but you did have the timeline of history and you traced the fuse of those three things and developed a red zone, you'd go, wow, something's about to happen right here. And, and the one person, and by the way, I looked at every other potential cause in the first century. If you look at every other person who ever lived in the first century, uh, all the big ones, the leaders of, of nations, the writers of poetry, the, the writers of history, none of them had any impact. You don't even know their names for the most part. Hmm. Yet this little dude, this little guy, <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, this nobody, this is the dude who changes all of history. And so to me, that was like, wow. Okay, so we're talking about the fuse that leads up to like uh, the, the crime, so to speak. Right. And we have the cultural fuse where in this history of the world, all of a sudden there's the right communication, the right roads, there's peace where a message could be widespread. There's the spiritual fuse where all these different stories of dying and rising gods that have pieces all come together Jesus arises at that moment where there's kind of a spiritual expectation. 
You also, the third one before we get to the fallout is what you call the prophetic fuse. And I love that you talk about clear versus cloaked prophecies, because I think sometimes those get muddled together. So talk about the prophetic fuse and make that distinction for us if you can. Yeah, you know, I, I was never impressed with um, prophecy. Uh, I know that sounds terrible as a Christian, right? Like, you know, you get all this, <laughs> typically all this stuff is used to make a case for the appearance of Jesus and the divine and supernatural um, nature of Jesus, because you have all this prophecy that is predicting Jesus. And I remember uh, being in this big church where I first heard anything about Jesus at all, and they had a guest speaker. And I remember that guest speaker spoke about prophecy. It was the first time I had ever been exposed to this idea that Jesus had been predicted. So I, I um, listened, and I traced along with him in the book, the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, right? Like, what, what is he saying is, is prophecy? And I remember, like, thinking... I'm like unimpressed. In other words, he would cite something in the Old Testament and I would read it and I would say, I'm not sure that's even about the Messiah, let alone Jesus. I mean, it seems like this is David talking about David or this is, you know, it didn't seem like it was specific to the Messiah. So here's what I did. I, I basically started to separate out all of the things that mm. I felt that no, like, make, make the distinction between clear, clear and cloaked. So, so sometimes in a, in a crime scene, you'll have something that will point to the suspect immediately given the technology we have. So, for example, if um, I had your fingerprint at a crime scene, well, we have a lot of fingerprints in the system right now, a ton, way more than we have DNA. So if I had a fingerprint and you happen to have your fingerprint in the system because you were fingerprinted for any number of reasons, uh, well, I can identify right away. That's the guy I'm looking for because his fingerprint is in the crime scene. So those are clear pieces of evidence that point to a suspect before I ever physically encounter him or meet him. I'm going to know who to go knock on the door because I've got clear evidence identifying the suspect. That's one kind of evidence. In the same uh, murder scene, I might have like a button or... Uh, like a button is a good example because um, hmm. I don't always know when a torn button you know, is laying on the crime scene. I, I can see the victim doesn't have a button missing, but maybe it came off a different shirt from the victim. How do I know that button is from our suspect? It might be, but I really won't know until I knock on the door of the suspect and do a search warrant and go through all of his shirts and see if any of his shirts are missing a button. If they are missing the same kind of button, well, that's a piece of cloaked evidence that didn't point to my suspect from the onset, but in hindsight, it will point to my suspect. And it'll confirm the guy who maybe the fingerprint identified. So that'll be used in trial. So I have clear evidence and cloaked evidence in any crime scene. I think that prophecies are kind of the same way. And so what I've done in the book is I've identified, this is hard to illustrate because so much of this is visual, right? And so I've drawn 400 illustrations for the book. So these are ways of visualizing all of this. But but you'll see in the book, what I've done is I've, I've, I've separated it out in the end notes are a big deal to me. I mean, the end notes were two thirds. So, so this book, one third is the actual book. Two thirds are the uh, case notes, but we knew we couldn't put that in a book. And I didn't want an academic book in that style anyway. Sure. So I kicked out all of those case notes to a PDF file. So when you buy the book, you'll see the link. You can go to the PDF file and download the PDF file. You'll see that it's two thirds. It's twice the size of the book. And that is really talking about all of those prophecies. I have separated them out. All the ones that are clear and point to our suspect before we ever identify him, hmm. they point that even Jews would say these are messianic prophecies. And then I have all the cloaked prophecies who really, you could argue that's not even about the Messiah, but turns out after the fact, the button matches the shirt. And you're like going, okay, this makes sense. Now, I will tell you a story, Sean. I'm not going to mention the names. But you and I have a good friend who's involved as an evangelist, and a member of his staff reached out to me who was deconverting, right? He was saying he was no longer a Christian. And the reason he was saying he was no longer a Christian was because he felt like the authors of the New Testament had abused and misused verses from the Old Testament that hmm. they claimed were prophecies of the Messiah. And every time he would land on one, Sure enough, he would land on one of these cloaked prophecies. Hmm. So I spent time on the phone with him, just trying to show him the difference between clear evidence and cloaked evidence. And although the cloaked evidence won't necessarily identify your suspect from the onset, 
it will confirm your suspect from hindsight. And that's what I think is happening here with a lot of these. So, so I'm very careful when I communicate, oh, there's these prophecies. I separate them into two bins. But I also in the book try to do another separation where I say, look, I've had informants that I've used on cases, especially when I was working undercover. That our whole We made a living using informants. And some of these informants are deemed reliable. So they're RIs, reliable informants. And some are de deemed confidential reliable informants, CRIs. So we have these, these different, these different uh, ways of identifying uh, informants. And reliable informants in terms of court proceedings are simply those informants that have already demonstrated their reliability by accurately telling us some piece of information that we confirmed. If they say, oh, this guy here, he did this crime over there. And then I go back and I find, oh, yeah, he did do that crime. Now, if he says that same guy's about to do a crime next week, we have a reliable, good reason to believe this. He's telling us the truth because hmm. he was reliable about the first piece of information. Why would I not trust him on the second? Okay. Well, you could actually divide profits the same way. You could take a look at the profits and say, you know what? Uh, some of these are more reliable than other. Not not saying all of them could be reliable, but what I mean is some make predictions about historical events, and those actually occurred. Hmm. So I would separate those out. And so here's my whole point. The reason why I separate out the reliable, we can look at a lot of, of, of prophets in the Old Testament, not all of them make predictions about historical events that actually occurred. You know, Ezekiel does, mm -hmm. Isaiah does, Daniel yep. does. Okay, great. Now, I, here's what I would say. If you're skeptical about prophecy, okay, I'm with you. Tell you what, just for sake of argument, just for sake of argument now, let's throw out all the cloaked prophecies. Get rid of them. Okay, I don't trust anything that the New Testament authors, some of those things in the New Testament are, in the Gospels, are uh, uh, an author citing a cloaked piece of evidence to say, hey, the button fits the shirt. Toss that out. Fine. Not only that, let's go ahead and toss out any prophecy made by anyone other than somebody who also predicted something historical that came true. In other words, a reliable prophet. Well, now you're down to like four prophets. And you're only down to half of their prophecies because only half of those are going to be clear. Tell you what, you have still got way more than enough reason to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So what I tried to do in the book is separate that out and show you that no, I don't care how you cut this pie, you're stuck with Jesus. And the prophecies from the Old Testament about Jesus are still strong, even if I was willing to toss out like two-thirds of them because they're either not from a reliable prophet or they're, again, when I say reliable, I mean previously tested by historical prophecies or they're cloaked toss all that stuff out for sake of argument you're still stuck with uh you're still stuck with uh, significant uh, prophecies that describe and what i tried to do in the book this is why you need to see it is i i think i did i don't know if anyone else has done this maybe you know like no, no one does anything new under the sun so i'm sure somebody <laughs> sure else sure but 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 what i tried to do was to say hey if i put them in a timeline and showed you where isn't that interesting uh, I thought this was kind of like, why? One of the questions that, one of the answers to the question, uh, why does Jesus show up when he does, does come down to prophecy. And if you look at the timeline, have you ever seen anyone list the prophecies, not based on who said them, but on when they were said in history? Well, it turns out if you did that, if you like broke them down and placed them on a timeline, you would realize that if you're trying to answer the six investigative questions, the what, when, where, how, why, and then finally the answer the who question, hmm. you don't have the answers to the first five until you get to Micah. And then you have the answer, or Malachi. And then you have the answer to the last one. So so, so you, 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 you'll you see that, yeah, if you stopped after the, you know, if you stopped halfway in the timeline, you don't have a couple of questions answered. But if you keep on going, the prophets answer all five of the investigative questions, leaving you with the who. Well, there's a reason why Jesus comes when he does, because he comes at the end of that history of prophecy, which now has completely identified, located, and given you the time frame, because Daniel gives you the time frame of when he's going to show up. That was interesting to me, just to see that, yeah, this is why he doesn't show up seven centuries earlier. If he showed up then, there's not enough prophecy to even identify him. But then you go get a little further, a little further. Oh, all these dominoes fall in place. Now, it's perfect time to show up. All right, for those of you watching, I want you to visualize that you have a fuse leading up to a crime scene. 
And the crime scene here we're talking about is the coming of Jesus as the God-man and then the fallout that comes after it. So the fuse is what you talked about culturally, communication, roads, uh, prophetically, certain expectations from the Old Testament. Yeah. And this spiritual fuse that there's this expectation even outside the Jewish religious community at that time for a spiritual figure like Jesus. Okay. The fallout is certain evidence you look after the crime yes. scene. Now, some of this, it, this section just blew me away. I can't imagine how much research and time this took, but talk about some of the fallout for Jesus. For example, in er, actually talk about how fallout matters for a crime scene first, and then we'll tie it to Jesus. Yeah, well, and you know this, right? Because you, you're a professor and you know how much you, you trust your, your research assistants. And so I, I've never had a research assistant until this book, but I just felt like even with all the time we had in COVID-19, I needed help. And I could give direction. A lot of it was just about sifting through a bunch of, like you know, dust to find fingerprints, right? So, so I did hire two research assistants and said, "Hey, here's what we're looking for. Mm. Let me know what you can find." And I credit them in the beginning of the book. So, so in the end, um, I, I think that was what made it possible. Now, as far as fallout goes, right? Look, sometimes after a crime, that our suspect will do certain things that he shouldn't do necessarily. Uh, the case okay. that I'm working on right now in Los Angeles, it's pretty clear that if you're going to destroy all of the property of the person you say just took off and you're going to destroy that property in the first week, well, why would you do that? If you think she just ran away, you, you would expect her to come back, right? Unless, you, of course, you know she's not coming back, hmm. in which case you're going to feel like you have the liberty to destroy all of her property. So when I see that happening early, I'm not trying to give you tips about how to your murder. <laughs> but the point is, if I see that early, I'm going to say, well, why would you do that? Why would you speak as though she's never coming back if you aren't quite sure if she's coming back? There are things that happen in the fallout after a murder takes place. They can kind of tip the hand of, of who's involved. Well, something similar happens with Jesus, right? I mean, something happens if you didn't know it was Jesus, uh, it, but something's going to happen in that first century that's going to change all of history. And it turns out that afterwards, Every significant aspect mm. of human history has the fingerprints of who? Oh, yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. And so it may be that Jesus of Nazareth is the reason why all of that history turned on a dime. So, so I looked at those areas. Now, I, I was very specific about this. I was interested in two things. Number one, because there's lots of books out there, and I have them sitting back here um, on my shelf. And I've, re I've, I've quoted those in my footnotes. Uh, there are lots of good books that are written by people who are talking about the impact that Jesus, Dinesh D'Souza wrote one recently. There's a bunch of these out there that talk about the impact that Jesus had, but none of them uh, attempt to sift through that impact to see if there's evidence we could use to reconstruct the story of Jesus. Remember, I, gotcha. I'm saying that Jesus had such an impact on history that you could reconstruct his story in every detail from history. So I'm only looking at those aspects of culture. I'll give you an example of this. Um, it's clear that Jesus has had an impact on the, on the way that we think about medicine and the way that we think about serving the poor and serving those who are underserved medically, right? But I'm looking for those aspects of culture that I could actually reconstruct the story of Jesus through them, not just the areas where he's had huge impact. So, for example, I include the medical sciences in my science chapter, but here's my point. I think there are six areas of culture that not only were forever changed by Jesus, but various fingerprints. And hmm. so from those fingerprints, you can reconstruct the story of Jesus. They are the literature, the visual arts and music, um, education, science, um, spirituality. Uh, these are so there's there's so there they are literature visual arts music education science and spirituality those are the six those six i think are the most important aspects that i revered of culture as an atheist so about halfway through this book i stopped and i said ah oh, man i don't you know look i write apologetics books this is what i do uh, i make a case and i try to stay in my lane uh, I, you know that for example i i don't often talk about cultural issues the sure. next book i'm going to start to branch out in that a little bit but for the most part i'm making a case for mm -hmm. jesus and for christianity from the evidence that's on the table and so i know i'm doing that but i got about halfway through this book and i, I wrote it back to my publisher and i said you know it strikes me this is really more a book about why jesus matters and i wanted to change the subtitle which we did 
Because it turned out that those six things, well, five of those six things, literature, music, visual arts, education, and science were the things that I most revered as an atheist, having no idea that we wouldn't be anywhere we are today in those five areas, if not for Jesus and his followers. Mm -hmm. So he mattered to me even before I knew he mattered because the areas of culture he impacted mattered to me. And it turns out I was indebted to Jesus. I remember yeah. I was in architecture. I, you know, I, I had my master's degree in architecture. So I'm in Germany with my wife visiting her family because she was born in Germany. And they used to make fun of me. I was there for a month. It was like, you know, church, castle, next city. We would go out every day driving around in my little Volkswagen, white Volkswagen Beetle that I rented. And we would we would go to church, a castle, and next city. Another church, another castle, next city. I was looking at the architecture. Well, it turns out the most spectacular architecture I was looking at was in churches. And it was all from Christ followers, inspired by Jesus, featuring mm. Jesus. Yet I just, like, that doesn't matter. I'm looking at the structure and the beauty of this. Uh, really? So it turns out that these areas of culture are so deeply, and you might say, well, that's in the West, Jim. No, no, no. If you're doing science anywhere in the world, you're indebted to that area of the world, European Christendom. Yeah, I get it. In the scientific revolution in Europe, people were all Christians, but it didn't have to happen there. There were more people everywhere else on the planet than there were in that tiny spot called Europe. Okay, it happened in Europe under Christendom for a reason. The worldview that was being uh, represented by that population was a Christian worldview, and it ignites the sciences in a way that other worldviews don't. So, yeah, I get it. You could say, but look, if you're doing science anywhere in Asia, if you're doing science in Persia, if you're doing science anywhere in the world, anywhere, it turns out you're still indebted to the fathers of science who came out of a Christian worldview. And the vast majority of the science fathers of every discipline from astronomy, chemistry, quantum mechanics, computer sciences, those are Christ hmm. followers. I mean, this is get over it. They are. The, the Nobel laureates in the sciences are dominated by Christians. Two to one, the next group coming down is, guess what, even a more amazing group, Jewish believers, hmm. or at least Jewish, if people identify as Jewish are the next group at about you know one half or a little less than half of the Christians. And then it drops off significantly. There are six times more Christians involved in the sciences as Nobel laureate winners than there are atheists and agnostics combined. I mean, we have a tendency to think that I, I cannot believe in supernaturalism, that a man rose from the grave and still be involved in the sciences. Really? We have always been that. We've always been that. We've always believed those two things. Christians have dominated this. Now, by the way, Muslims were involved in, and were heavily involved in the yeah, sciences that's true. the Middle Ages and then drop off, the, drop off the map. Why? Theological reasons, I think. There's a book called The Closing of the Muslim Mind that tries to kind of parse that out. Sure. But the reality of it is, is that we have to make a choice as Christians. If we don't know our involvement in the, how important Christ and his followers have been to the sciences, and we now think, well, we, that this is not a, a Christian endeavor, shame on us. Young people need to be involved. Young Christians need to be involved in the sciences. One of the things that catalyzed the sciences under Christianity was this view that, yes, while the written uh, special revelation of the New Testament and of the Bible is closed, the natural revelation and what we learn about God from the natural sciences is still open. It's never going to contradict the special revelation, but there is more to be discovered. And, and you get a chance to write in that book, the book of, of uh, natural revelation, if you're a scientist, worshiping God with your mind. Let's jump in through these and just kind of give maybe some some quick bullet point answers so people get the broad argument that you're making here. You're not necessarily saying this makes Christianity true, if I understand it correctly. You're saying if God did step into history, this is the kind of fallout we would expect, and we that's see it right. with Jesus and not no, even right. close to any other figure who's ever existed. Yeah. Does that so sum it up correctly? Okay. Yes, you did a great job of that because I think the reality of it is we can make a case for the historicity of Jesus just from history. The historicity okay. of Jesus is connected to reality, and we have a reality in history that demonstrates the historicity of Jesus. But beyond okay. that, I think that the expectation I would have that this dude, think about this dude. 
you watch The Chosen in the last couple of years, right? We watched this series called The Chosen, and we're all like going, oh, this is going to... Again, I want you to put yourself... At least that visually gives you a sense of the part of the world and the group he's leading and the nature of who he... Would you expect that guy to have this kind of impact on history? I just think that's remarkable. And I talk about this in the book. I look, make a list of all the other people in the first century. Forget about that. I make a list of all the other world leaders, most of whom you won't recognize. And mm. they didn't have this kind of impact on history. Mo all, I made a list of all of the religious leaders and deities. No, not like Jesus of Nazareth. I made a list of all the other people who claim to be the Jewish Messiah. And there are a number of those. You don't even know their names because they're not the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> so it turns out that this guy has an, an, an unparalleled impact on history that makes no sense at all if he's just an ancient sage in the first century in Jerusalem, but makes perfect sense if he is the God who created all of us. When, if God stepped into the world as a man, you would expect him to reorder hmm. history, to be to all of history would align for his arrival, and then afterwards, the huge impact would be like no other person in the history of persons. That's why he's a person. Now, I do think this kind of unparalleled impact should at least make us say, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe I should read the New Testament. And that's why I wanted to write a book that was kind of like the companion piece to Cold Case Christianity, right? Because that's everything inside the New Testament. This right. is everything outside the New Testament. So give us the quick kind of Twitter thoughts on the effect in the fallout for music. Because when you first showed me these slides, I, it was it was pretty remarkable. So paint that picture quickly for us, then I want to jump to universities. Okay, so two things, impact and then reconstructing the story. Impact is, is unparalleled. It's not just in Western culture. You'll see if you are a big fan of music today and you made a list of the top 150 artists in pop music, rock, rap, country, whatever it is, they're available right now on Billboard magazine. They're available at Rolling Stone. It's available at IMDb. I made a list of all of those. There's about 150 artists, all but two have sung a song about Jesus. Not necessarily a nice song, Sometimes it's pejorative. But the point is, you cannot say that about any other historical figure or mm. any other God, deity, or religious leader. Only one person draws that kind of attention. You say, well, that's Western music, Jim. Oh, really? Not necessarily. It turns out that Western music has had a global impact. If you listen to what I what's known as K-pop, Korean pop music, pretty cool, actually. But it kind of feels like, you know, like uh, boy bands, you know, from the uh, from the 90s. But the point is, if you listen to that, they're they're emulating the, the genre of music that the Jesus followers or people who sung about Jesus, whether they were followers or not. One of my favorite stars uh, movie uh, or songs is by um, I'm trying to remember who did this. Uh, the song was Jesus thinks you're a jerk. <laughs> I forget who did it. But I thought, <laughs> this is awesome, right? I mean, people use Jesus as a source of inspiration or infuriation in, in all of their, their, their music. No one has had the impact on music. And by the way, the mm. history of music, I, I looked at all of the significant milestones in the history of music. Like when do we move from just kind of monotone chants to uh, like harmonies? Oh, a Christ follower did that. Oh, when do we move from memorizing and communicating melodies by memory from one person to another to actually writing down melodies on musical scale. Like who, oh, a Christ follower invented that. Hmm. Oh, when did we move toward, it turns out every significant advancement in the history of music is not only made by Christ followers, but it's typically done in a Christian setting. So it turns out that if, whatever you're listening to today, if you were to kind of draw out the, the rough structure of the music, is it, are there harmonies involved? Are there major and minor scales? Well, those were created by Christ followers. If it's using certain kinds of instruments, a pretty, pretty good chance those were created by Christ followers. If you just look at what's being done in music today, it's in, even though you may not have any idea that that's where it came from, that's the kind of impact that Jesus had. Why? Because the worldview inaugurated by Jesus was a singing worldview born out of the Judeo-Christian hmm. Jewish culture. As a matter of fact, you'll see that, that the Psalms that were sung by David in the Psalms are, uh, most scholars think those are the same songs that were sung, for example, by Jesus at the Lord's Supper. Hmm. And, and it turns out the rich tradition of music, if all you had 
were the hymns sung by Christians in the first 400 years. And not only have I identified those for you in the book, I've gone through every one of those hymns, and I'll tell you what you can pull out of each hymn. You can reconstruct the story of Jesus and the rich theology of the Christian worldview if all you had was the music of the first four centuries. That, to me, is a huge impact, and it helps us to establish, again, you could destroy the New Testament, but unless you're willing to also destroy the history of music, you will not erase Jesus. That is, to me, one of the most interesting things from your book. When you look at the fallout for movies, you can reconstruct the life of Jesus. The fallout for music, reconstruct the life of Jesus. Art in the early century, scenes and life of Jesus. Architecture, universities, scientists and their writings. This doesn't prove Christianity is true. But what you're saying, it's the kind of fallout we would expect if it That's were right. true, which yeah. should make us pause and think, wait a minute, why did this yeah. guy have such a transformative influence on world history? Especially when you think about the fact that he traveled by foot, had no political power, his okay. family was insignificant, uh, he wasn't married, had no military power. Why him is the question you're asking in this book. And I think yeah. Christians and skeptics should read it with an open mind. Now, one more question that we're going to shift and take some live questions. Okay. I see some cool. questions. I see some pushback, which is great, which I yeah. know you enjoy. What about the fallout for other religions? And you go into depth on Hinduism, Mithraism, Islam. We don't have the time to go into each one of those. Right. But talk about the influence Jesus had on other religions and how it's unique compared to any other religious figure. Well, what's fascinating is that everything that follows Jesus, of course, you would expect at some point to hat tip or acknowledge Jesus. And that's true. If it's Islam or Ahmadiyya uh, uh, Islam, or if it's uh, Baha'i, or if it's New Age spirituality, anything that follows Jesus in the timeline of established world religions, those folks, the leaders of those groups, or even their own scripture, will acknowledge Jesus in some, they'll find a place, they'll emerge, mention, or modify their, relig their, yeah. their uh, religious beliefs to accommodate Jesus. But what's interesting is that there are a number of religions that preceded Jesus, like Buddhism and Hinduism and, 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 and the worship of Addis and Mithras. All of these preceding uh, religions also end up merging Jesus in, in some way. Well, how can that be? They preceded Jesus. Well, because they existed then on the other side of the timeline for at least a short period of time. So although they started before Jesus, they extended into the common era. And once they get into the common era, they're like, oh, we got to do something with this Jesus guy. So you will see that like leaders in the Buddhist movement or Hindu leaders, they will make room for Jesus. They will say that Jesus can be described in a way that's consonant with their, with their religious beliefs of that system. They will describe him as an enlightened man or as another manifestation as the Baha'i faith does. They will find room for Jesus in their system, even though many of these pre-existed Jesus. Now that's interesting to me, right? Here's why. Jesus doesn't do that in return. <laughs> It's not like, you know, true. He, he comes in the middle of that timeline of all these spiritual worldviews, and he never says, oh, yeah, we can accommodate Buddha. Well, Buddha precedes him. No. We can accommodate Indra. No. Krishna. No. Zoroaster. No. He doesn't accommodate anyone who precedes him. And instead, he says, I'm the only way. I'm the way to the Father. Except through me. He ain't getting there. Isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? Everyone wants to hat tip and borrow from Jesus, but Jesus doesn't borrow from anyone else. And that, to me, I think is interesting to see that. So that's why when we say typically, if you're gonna, if you're interested in spiritual things, you ought to start with Jesus, because it turns out you could reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the way that non-Christian religions describe him, because they mm. often will admit to certain characteristics of Jesus in order to incorporate them into. So here's what's interesting about that: I have a map in the book where I show all of the places where non-Christian traditions have touched the global map. It turns out you would know something about Jesus in all of those far corners of the world mm. where Christianity is not dominant just because those world religions make room for Jesus. That mm. to me is fascinating. That's the kind of impact that Jesus had, even on systems that are non-Christian. All right, Jim, let's take some questions. And when we're done, I'm going to let you pick the questions you find most helpful, most interesting for whatever okay. criteria you want. 
Uh, so if you have a question for Detective Wallace, please place it in here. Brief, succinct, to the point. L uh, let me start with one that I think is is interesting from uh, Pine well, Creek, uh, okay. a, a skeptic who watches my show. I hope you'd use that term, sure. and that's fine. Uh, he says, did Christianity ever hurt the progress of science? So uh, usually the story that's used in describing the way that, it, it, that it's Christianity, Christianity now, has somehow hindered science is typically formed in the person of Galileo, right? Because Galileo's story, here he is as somebody who is um, heliocentric. He believes the universe, our, our solar system at rather, is revolving and centered on the sun and that the earth is rotating around the sun. Well, look, at the time, the Pope who was in, I have a whole part of my chapter on this, the Pope who was uh, in power at that time, uh, actually argued for a geocentric uh, solar system in which the, set, the center of the solar system is Earth and everything rotates around the Earth. So this story about how Galileo was treated by the Catholic Church and how he was actually under house arrest because he held a view that was opposed by the Pope is so, you have to kind of dig in the weeds here a little bit because it turns out the Pope was actually somebody who accepted the science prior to Galileo because the science prior to Galileo through Aristotle and through Ptolemy was for a geocentric solar system. So it's not as though that what was happening here is you've got Galileo against the church. First of all, it's not Galileo against Christianity regardless. The most you could say is that Galileo was opposed to Catholic leadership. That's all you could say, right? But it turns out that, that the Catholic leadership at the time advanced the cause of the, 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 the scientific consensus of the time, which was for, for geocentrism. So what you really have is a science versus science. This is always the case, right? Now, it turns out that if you look at the, there were many, there was a couple uh, who preceded Galileo who also believed in a heliocentric universe. Uh, solar system. For example, uh, Copernicus was somebody who believed in that. Um, so if you look at, now why were those people not under the same kind of condemnation, let's say, as Galileo? Well, if you read through the history of Galileo, Galileo had a personality issue, okay? He, he not <laughs> only held this view, but he also would kind of take jabs at the Pope. And he would make, he wrote a book in which he really mocked the Pope pretty openly. And a lot of what you're seeing between the Pope and Galileo has to do with Galileo's presentation of his ideas rather than his ideas themselves. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. nobody contributed more to the advancement of astronomy and the sciences than the papacy, than the Roman Catholic papacy, because they had a vested interest in this. No one was exposed to more about uh, cosmology than uh, people in the middle centuries when they were exposed under Catholic formed universities that were teaching the sciences. So it turns out that yes, was there a, that story, that iconic story that people sometimes point to, to say, well, look, you know, uh, Galileo was trying to show the truth about the, the heliocentric solar system and the Pope opposed him. Well, remember the Pope actually supported the view held by scientific thinkers prior to Galileo. And at some point, of course, Science always turns over science. We learn more, we discover more about the natural realm, and we embrace those discoveries. And no one has done more for the advancement of the sciences than the mm -hmm. modern universities. Well, who formed those? Oh yeah, Christians. Turns mm -hmm. out Bologna, Paris, and Oxford, the three modern universities. Now you can say that were there learning institutions before those three? Yeah, but they weren't the kind of modern university you and I know in which there's a body of students a body of faculty who are, are, are uh, uh, awarding diplomas to people who graduate after meeting certain criteria. That's a very modern uh, idea of education. That is uniquely Christian. It comes out of those three universities. As a matter of fact, if all you did was look at the top 15 universities in the world today, they were all formed by Christians. Hmm. They may not be teaching Christianity. They may not even be favorable to Christianity today. Hmm. But if you went back to those universities and examined their campuses, and looked at the buildings and the images and verses of scripture that are on their buildings, the original buildings, you could reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the physical campuses of the top 15 universities in the world. Hmm. And I did that in the book. Keena Lynch has a question for you. It says, which evidence would you say is the most important one uh, that lead or, or leads to the existence of Jesus outside the Bible? Music? So I don't know which is the most important, but I do know this. I was surprised to find, so whatever I did, in every one of these categories, 
I reassembled what could be known about Jesus from literature. What could be, in the first three centuries, I looked at every voice that is available out there in ancient history in the first three centuries of the common era, both Christian, non-Christian, Jews, Greeks, Persians, Romans, mm -hmm. in the first three centuries. And I went that far because I felt like, okay, look, this is all prior to the Edict of Milan and the Edict of Thessalonica. So these are prior to Christianity being comfortable in a power structure that might corrupt the message of Christianity. So we're going to look at only those voices that are speaking about Jesus and the up and down cycle of persecution and tolerance and disruption that was experiencing in the first three centuries. Once you get to the third century, 325, I stop. Because then I think you can make okay. an argument. That, you know, so, so I looked at those, those mm. voices. You can reconstruct the story of Jesus from those pretty powerfully from the church fathers, the ancient non-Christians, the non-canonical authors, you mm -hmm. can reconstruct the story of Jesus. I looked at that from music, I looked at that from the arts. Surprisingly, the most robust reconstruction possible is from the personal writings of the science fathers, those oh, fathers of the sciences who also wrote about Jesus in their personal journals. So if all you had was the hmm. history of science and you wanted to know more, and you might think, oh, well, he's talking about Copernicus or he's talking about somebody like in the third century or the, not third, really, the 13th century or the 15th century. No, it turns out that we still have the, we still dominate. Uh, you, you can find living scientists today who are Nobel Prize winners and are, are prize winners in every other. Oh, there's a ton of, by the way, scientific prizes. I got sure. a list of those in the book. And you can find that those winners of prizes are most of them are Christ followers. And they even today write about Jesus. So if you'd have to erase the history of science to get rid of the truth about hmm. Jesus. That's awesome. Here's here's one for you that I wonder if you've, you've thought about. Andrew Green says, is there a runner up for most influential historical figure uh, how would their influence pan against the case for Christ? Really good question. Um, I'd like somebody to ask that question other than me. I, I don't. I can't think of anyone who comes close. Mm -hmm. If you just look at the number of, of books written about historical figures, the gap is pretty great, right down to. And I'm trying to. I'm gonna. I'll never get it up in time, Sean. Uh, it's in my case notes on this book. Okay. But, but if you look, the gap is huge. So in terms of historical figures that have an impact on literature, that, that is, 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 is it's, it's a huge gap, and there's nobody even close. But I can tell you, though, is if you look at the, my list of people in the first century who lived, historical figures who lived, uh, most of you will recognize a couple, but just a couple. To be honest, there's nobody who's had that. If all you said, mm. is it fair? But even if, that's why I said, even if you looked at the entire list of important, I just Googled it. Right. Because I'm thinking, hey, <laughs> um, most of it, here's why I say that. I love using Google sometimes and Wikipedia as a source. Why? Because it's not very friendly to Christians. And most of the mm. time, if you're a scientist on and you're on Wikipedia, they have scrubbed your Christian identity all altogether. Now, if they do admit that you're a Christian, it's like, whoa, you know. So I'm only touching the tip of the iceberg because it turns out that most of these histories of scientists, for example, they've had their Christian identity removed. And it's hard to get back to that. So whatever I'm pitching, trust me, it's far stronger than what I'm pitching because I'm only pitching the stuff that comes from the most skeptical sources possible. And I tried my best to limit myself to the most skeptical sources and provide you with links. So if I'm telling you this dude's the father of whatever, of, you know, um, of microbiology or he's the father of quantum mechanics, I'm providing you with the link to go to it's basically a secular source where they're calling him the father of quantum mechanics. Mm. So it turns out, I mean, this is, I'm trying to be as neutral as I can on that. Mm. And that's where I told my research assistants to focus. So you'll use a source like that to start and get attention and then track down right. the real source exactly. itself. That's exactly. the beginning so point. So you start off by somebody, I just need a pointer. And once he's pointed, well, then I got to find the books that are out there that actually support that case. But here's what, but here's the problem. Um, there's a bunch of people I'm sure who are listed in the sciences, for example, on Wikipedia, who I can't even start as a pointer because they've removed their Christian mm. identity. Mm. So that's okay. Because when you see the list of 950 of the science fathers, you'll think it's enough. Hmm. 
Jim, one last question for you, then uh, gonna gonna let you run. Want to respect the time. Uh, this one doesn't relate directly to what you've been presenting, but I think it's an interesting one to start, uh, to kind of end with. I've never asked you this myself. Uh, this comes from the Myth Vision podcast. Okay. Could could Jay Warner Wallace be wrong about Jesus? Is it even possible in his mind that Jesus did not rise from the dead? Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. Anything and everything is possible. So is it possible I'm wrong? Of course. <laughs> Give me a break. The standard of, of proof, though, is not beyond a possible doubt. It's possible that you're not even watching this right now. You're dreaming the entire thing. It's possible that we aren't really in two different rooms. Or any, it's all, all kinds of things are possible. But it turns out the standard of proof, on any case, is, is not beyond a possible doubt, because I'd never reached that. I've never reached beyond a possible doubt on any case. Hmm. There's always questions I could offer that I can't answer. Hmm. There's always are. So is it possible I'm wrong? Oh, Yeah. But I'm not aiming at that standard. I'm aiming at beyond a reasonable doubt. By the way, none of us live a life in which we are living at beyond a possible doubt. If that's the case, did you brush your teeth this morning? You realize that sometimes people people have actually died of toothpaste poisoning. <laughs> and you brushed your teeth? And did you plug anything into the wall? People are electrocuted every day by bad wiring. Did you start your car? Cars explode every day all over America for one malfunction or another. Did you drive in the air? In other words, if you had the standard that I have to be absolutely correct beyond a possible doubt, you would not leave your house. You would be paralyzed. It turns out what we do every day is we live at a different standard. Yeah, it's possible that could happen to me, but it's not reasonable, so I'm going to go do it. It's possible that I could be wrong about what's in this glass, but it's not reasonable, so I'm going to drink it. We don't hmm. live and express and, and, and move in the world with the prohibitive standard of it must be true beyond a possible doubt. As a matter of fact, judges tell juries that you don't have that standard about anything, and you should not use that standard in this case because, judges will say in California, I could offer a possible or imaginary doubt about anything. Hmm. So I never worry about, well, do I have opening questions about Jesus? Uh, yeah. Is it possible I'm wrong? Yeah. I don't think it's reasonable that I'm wrong. Hmm. I think I'm beyond a reasonable doubt, but I could never get beyond a possible doubt. And so that's why I think we, we have to get to a place where we say, hey, when is good enough good enough? And that's really the question is when do I reach a point where I'm like, okay, and, and ask yourself this question, what's keeping you up? All right, have you have a standard? By the way, you don't hold that standard hmm. for anything else. So why are you holding that standard for Jesus, that standard hmm. for God? You don't hold that standard. It's possible right now your spouse is cheating on you. You've been cheating on you for five years. That's possible. Are you going to be paranoid and checking your text messages? No. You're going to let your reasoning capacity tell you what's beyond a reasonable doubt, and you're going to live that way because otherwise you're a paranoid danger to the world because you can't live beyond a possible doubt. So I think this understanding what is the standard of proof is huge which is why I spend a whole chapter on it in uh, Cold Case Christianity. If you can't get beyond that, you but you be, be honest, be fair. You don't hold that standard for anything else. But it comes to God, oh, now suddenly the standard is a lot higher. Really? The highest standard in criminal trials is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a high enough standard for anything. That's good enough for me. Hmm. I love it. Well, we've got a few minutes over, so we got to give away uh, copies of your book. By the way, I don't feel bad because you gave long answers, so it's on. It's on you. I know. For... <laughs> I, know. I know. You know me already, Sean. You know I'm I can't just messing with you. Answer. Hey, we've got. What? If you had Greg Kokel on this thing right now, you know, you and I both know. Okay, Greg would be. We used to be going. You'd be on question number one right now. All right. Maybe. So, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. I love it. Okay, we're giving away two copies of your book, Person of Interest, right. and uh, I hope I didn't miss any. I wrote down there were four questions, actually two uh, non-believers, two I think who are Christians, and you just pick whichever one you think is most interesting. One was about what was. The, I don't know who. Well, it does. It doesn't matter who matters the question. And we'll send it to him. Yeah, you know, I thought the uh, last two questions were really good, so I don't know who okay. those people are, or if they're believers or non-believers. But the last two questions, that's who I would give it to. 
All right, we'll take it. So Myth Vision, you got yourself a copy of the new book by Jay Warner Wallace. Well, this is awesome. Sorry. I'm going to be sorry, Sean, uh, that at some point there'll be a four-hour uh, video on why I'm an idiot. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm willing to take that chance. That's awesome. I appreciate it. So Myth Vision and Andrew, you also had the second to last question. I recognize Andrew Green. You've been in a bunch. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you guys will email into apologetics at biola.edu. Apologetics at biola dot edu we will send you a copy of jim's latest book uh by the way those of you who join us make sure you hit subscribe we've got some fascinating interviews coming up next week have lee stroll we'll talk about his new book the case for heaven oh, that's gonna be good. i have a story coming up soon interviewing an expert on the story of c.s lewis from atheist to christian apologist mm. have both craig keener and jp moreland coming on to talk about mm. the modern case for the miraculous so Make Good. sure you hit subscribe. You're not going to want to miss some of the shows we have coming up. Jim, hang on one minute afterwards uh, so we can chat. But to the rest of you, we will see you very soon. Have a wonderful evening.